The uh, Baha'i Club of Stanford welcomes everyone here this evening. It's nice to see a big room full of people. Um, first, uh, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> the uh, Baha'is on campus, for all those who in this large audience who are not Baha'is, uh, is a small group, but we make a lot of noise for our numbers. And you'll notice, you see notices from time to time, both in what's around the quad in the daylight, you hear public service spots on KZSU, and you'll notice um, posters every now and then on the kiosks and the coffee house and around the different living areas <coughs> on campus. So uh, the word Baha'i, strange as it may look, uh, is at least fairly well identified in the middle of a board full of other posters. So uh, keep looking for our activities, and we'll have a variety of them throughout the year. We're pleased to have with us this evening Dr. Fris Kazemzadeh. Dr. Kazemzadeh was born in Moscow. He was educated there, uh, took his baccalaureate and master's degree here at Stanford, and his doctorate at Harvard in Russian studies and literature. Uh, he's been a professor of history at Yale since 1956. Um, he's also taught at UC, at Lewis and Clark, Columbia and Harvard, among others. Uh, his Baha'i activities of, of note uh, include being the editor of the World Order magazine, uh, copies of which are in uh, the library here. Uh, he's taught two, about the Baha'i faith, two Baha'is and uh, lectured on the faith around the world. Uh, he's also a member of the national governing body of the Baha'is in the United States and uh, probably the most significant to non-Baha'i audiences uh, is that he's been asked to write the article uh, explaining the Baha'i faith for the upcoming edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I was uh, preparing my outline, I figured that I would uh, appear before an audience at Stanford where I understand there is a very small group of Baha'is and therefore the likelihood was that uh, the majority of those present would know either nothing or very little about the Baha'i faith and uh, so I was going to start way off freely and talk about other things which would indirectly illustrate some of the Baha'i uh, positions when I came here and I look around and I see too many familiar faces and this of course presents, presents a difficulty for the speaker because uh, those who are behind this will inevitably be uh, bored or disappointed because they are going to hear the same things uh, all over again. But for that there is no remedy and uh, so I will proceed as if most of you have never heard about the Baha'i faith and uh, are desperately interested in finding out what is this, what is this strange thing with a peculiar name uh, all about. Well, in fact, I will not even start there. I will not begin with an explanation of the meaning of the term Baha'i, but rather I'd like to, I'd like to take you back to the last couple of days and the kind of news that one has been hearing on the radio about the United States having arrived after so many years of war in Southeast Asia to the, to the brink of, of peace, the wonderful perspectives at last of, uh, of the termination of a rather unpleasant, uh, bloody and in the opinion of many people quite useless war. Now this is very significant because of course 
course, the, the young people, when they think of the war, think of uh, the war in Vietnam. My father, who is 74 years old, when he says the war, he still thinks of the First World War. See, that was the war, then there was the Second World War. When I say the war, I keep thinking of the Second World War, and people, younger people, stop me and say, which war do you mean? You mean the Korean War, the Vietnam War? No, 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 the war, you know. <laughs> Second World War. But it is, it is quite significant that generation after generation, my children, myself, my father, and way back, the existence of all of us has been punctuated by, by war, by conflict. We measure epochs and eras in wars. Somebody has said that the history of mankind is nothing but the history of, of warfare. Or you could put it another way and say that our history is a history of our pathology. But what we actually study is the history of our diseases, of our troubles, rather the history of our, our few jewels. Now, of course, any peace, any sign of an improvement in international relations is, is welcome, is wonderful. But the temptation of falling into the trap of thinking that any particular peace constitutes the arrival of peace to the capital P. This temptation has to be resisted. I was a student here at Stanford years ago when the Second World War came to an end. And I remember the enthusiasm, the joy, two more wars. And right here in San Francisco, at the, at the Opera House, the first meeting of the United Nations was being held, the founding meeting of the United Nations. And when I expressed a certain pessimism as to whether this was indeed the end of all wars, I was looked upon as a spoil sport of some kind, as a nasty little kid who goes around being cheeky and arrogant and tells everybody that no, this doesn't look like, like peace. Well, of course, soon thereafter, there was uh, the Korean War and uh, how many wars since then, it's even difficult to remember. There were several wars between India and Pakistan, several wars between the Arabs and the Israelis, and various other minor and major encounters in many, many parts of the, of the world. And so, now also, even though peace in Southeast Asia, of course, is to be welcomed, I think it would be premature and naive to expect that this is going to be the termination of a cycle of wars that has been with us for a very long time. Moreover, war is only one manifestation of conflict. People can be destroyed without war. Racism, class conflict, and even crime, and here by crime, I, I take not just the narrow view of being mugged in the street, but it also includes the activities of a certain portion of uh, so-called legitimate business and all sorts of other things qualify actually as, as crime. This is just as harmful to society at times as uh, open warfare. Now, it is easy to talk about symptoms and uh, most people like to dwell on symptoms because symptoms are so obvious. You cannot, you cannot deny that a person has a fever if he is hot to the touch and if you give him a thermometer and it shows, you know, after 28 years in the United States, I still think that fever begins at 37 centigrade. <laughs> <coughs> well, anyway, whatever it is, 19, 19, uh, Nine something over that you have a you have a fever. All right, that's that's simple. But it is much more difficult to look for underlying causes. And I think that usually when people talk about causation in war, causation in conflict, they are not really talking about the the causes. They are talking about intermediary causes, so to speak. They are simply pushing the thing a little bit further but they will not go to the, to the 
essence of things. And it seems to me that essentially what is happening is that mankind today does not have a common language in which to discuss peace or war. There is no common value system. There is really no way to come to an agreement because even when people sit at conference tables, when they talk to each other, they don't talk to each other. The only kind of peace that is possible and will continue to be possible for a long time, and mind you, that peace is better than no peace, but the only kind of peace that will be possible for a long time will be the peace of mutual fear, exhaustion, the kind of peace that we have had with the atomic power where nobody actually dares to stop the Holocaust. The idea is too horrible. Now that in itself, that in itself, as I said, is nothing to, to sneer at. That is better than destruction. And yet, and yet a stalemate is not the same as, as peace. A stalemate has demoralizing effects on, on mankind. And nobody knows it better than the younger generation that has been born since the liberation of the atomic energy. And a lot of the problems that the young people have, of course, today is a result of living in a world in which peace has, been, has become synonymous with survival for a while, maybe. Now, if people are to make peace truly, to create a society which would be, which would be rid of major conflicts, then people will have to discover some kind of uh, common language. Now you can call it any, anything you want. You can call it a common ideology, common philosophy, but such a philosophy does not exist today. There are no two people in the world, and by this I don't mean two individuals, no, no large blocks of people who are really in agreement not even within the nation states. The cleavages, the separations, the divisions go in every conceivable uh, direction. Now the prevailing, the prevailing philosophy, the unexpressed philosophy, if you, if you wish, is essentially the philosophy that first made its impact on humanity in the 18th century. It is a kind of simple-minded materialism which has finally percolated from the upper educational levels down to the generality of mankind. And today, interestingly enough, is very largely represented in the social sciences. Now, the social sciences present an image of man which is uh, <coughs> an image which is largely accepted today. It is, a, it is a compound. It has bits and pieces of this and that and the other thing. There is a dash of Marxism to it, a little bit of Freud, not too much because obviously Freud includes so much mythology that if you take too much it becomes fantastic. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but on the whole, you see, this, this image is quantitative, it is mechanistic, and it attempts to treat man as a thing. That is the essential element. You treat men as things. Therefore, you start a crusade against value. Because value obviously is subjective, value is not quantifiable, and therefore you cannot cope with it. If you cannot cope with it, you just throw it out. And it's very interesting. But when the social climate, when the intellectual climate of an epoch is ready, then different arts and sciences, different disciplines and branches of learning, they all coalesce to that same view. For instance, philosophers who are not in any kind of a conspiracy with economists, economists who are not in a conspiracy with sociologists, Sociologists who may not even want to talk to political scientists, they all, each one of them separately, arrive at certain similar conclusions. And the conclusion is, of course, that science must be value-free. Therefore, 
if somebody writes a historical book and expresses a thought that somebody in the past was good and somebody was bad, a reviewer will attack him and say he's moralizing. Now notice, to moralize has become a bad word. Now what should a historian do? Immoralize? <laughs> Whatever he should do, he should not moralize. He should not pass value judgments. And of course this applies to uh, economics, to sociology, to all of these, to all of these human activities. Now, the difficulty is this, that it is impossible to have any social science without values. It is impossible for a, hu for a human being to do anything to say anything, to have an expression of his faith without betraying some kind of an implicit value system, whether he wants to admit it or not. For instance, people talk about economics. Well, economics, you know, supply and demand, objective forces, has nothing to do with, with human values. And yet, the beginning of economics, of course, is division of labor. If there is no division of labor, there is no exchange. The beginning of economics, socially speaking and historically speaking, is division of labor and exchange of goods and services. Now, have you ever thought that prior to that, epistemologically prior to that, there must be a morality and confidence that exchange is possible? For instance, how are we going to have an exchange of labor? How am I going to go fishing if I cannot trust you to plant corn? Because if I spend my time fishing, in the meantime you don't plant corn, then I may not be able to survive on fish. See, division of labor is only possible in a society. And a society is only possible where there is at least a modicum of trust and confidence in the other fellow. So certain moral characteristics of man, even before there is a society really, have to be already present for an economic system to arise. It makes no difference what kind of economic system. Moreover, the very decision to indulge in what is called a value-free science is in itself a value decision. Now, if this is the case, then I suppose it is time to stop playing around and pretend that one can deal with human beings or with society in a way in which one presumably deals with inanimate man, with things. Well, suppose we make that step and then we say, all right, man then needs value and value is not something which comes from a test tube Value is something which comes from some other sources. What sources? Well, traditionally, historically, value came from religion. All right, let's take a look at religion. What are the religions offering mankind in the way of value? Well, most of the religions known to us, all you have to do is to open a university catalog under the rubric of religion, and you will see courses are taught perhaps on Buddhism, some on Christianity, in some very enlightened and large, powerful universities that can afford it, there may even be course, a course on Islam. <laughs> then of course there will be some courses on sects of a given religion. But essentially you will find that when people talk about religion, they talk about systems, philosophies, ways of thinking, which are very, very old. And here we get ourselves into another dilemma. Namely, the application of systems of values which appeared not only in a pre-industrial era, but in an age, under circumstances, to people who have very, very little in common with the kind of mankind that inhabits the world today. So what are we going to do about this? You sense perhaps 
as you read, let us say, the, the New Testament, you sense that there is a value in Christianity. But which of the values expressed in those books are applicable and which are not? Who is going to be the judge? For instance, if St. Paul tells you that the husband is the head and that he is to chastise his wife and if she doesn't obey him he ought to beat her, is this part of Christianity or isn't it? Now, I'm not just saying this to be facetious, it's a very serious problem. If you decide, no, that part of the New Testament isn't good anymore, why can't you decide that some other part of the New Testament isn't good anymore? In other words, who becomes the criterion? Who is the yardstick? Who decides what has become obsolete and what is still valuable? Now, over this, religions argue and disagree, and as they argue and disagree, they present a solid spectacle, which makes people leave them alone. Why mess around with anything you saw? Even though people almost instinctively respond to religion when it does not get bogged down in such, in such problems. There was at Yale, some years ago, he is now uh, dead, a very brilliant biologist, Edmund Sinner, who also happened to be a fine New England type gentleman of the, of the old school. And some of those people really were remarkable. They were people of uh, great probity. They were people of character. They were trustworthy and they were philanthropic in the best sense of the term. Sinnott, a great biologist, was one of those men. And so he worried about this. And he decided that what mankind really needed was agreement on basic religious problems. Now how do you arrive at an agreement? Well, how do decent people arrive at an agreement? They come together, they sit down, they talk things over. So Sinat decided that there should be some kind of a super commission made up perhaps of 100 most brilliant people on earth. This would include mathematicians, biologists, physicists, political scientists, representatives of religion, statesmen, leaders of the economy, 100 people. They will sit down together and they will decide what can be selected from the New Testament and from the Old Testament, from the Quran and from the Zend Avesta, from the scriptures of the Hindus and from the scriptures of the, of the African peoples, from all the body of religion that mankind has produced. They will select the best and that will become the religion of mankind. Now of course what he was saying was that a committee of 100 well-meaning people in the world today will become Jesus Christ. It will become the Savior. And if you put it in those terms, you see how ridiculous the whole thing is. Also how the essence of religion is totally and completely misunderstood. Because if it was a work of a committee that was needed, why wasn't there a committee of 100 in the year one? Why didn't the people of the Middle East, the Arabs in the seventh century, put together a committee of Zoroastrian Magian priests, of some Christians, monarchists from the Coptic Church in Egypt, Catholics from Rome, Orthodox in Constantinople, get together in all, discuss things, and write the Quran? Of course, committees not only won't produce religion, committees produce very little that is created. I'm sure that most of you, most of you have heard some of the good and the bad jokes about committees, such as for instance, one that says that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> so, 
to expect to expect a committee or a group of people to design a religion or a system of value by which people could live and act is, is really I don't want to call it a pipe dream because I'm sure that Mr. Sinnott and people of, of his type don't indulge in opium smoking but it is some other kind of dream nevertheless well the fact of the matter is that religion is not something which comes voluntarily it is not something which is manufactured it happens it seems to be something like a force of nature it is either there or it isn't it is an individual ultimately that is a religion it is a man who comes before other men and tells them I have a message I have something to tell you and ultimately he does not even argue ultimately there is really no logic to it logic can come later once the conviction occurs once through some mysterious process which is not quantifiable and which is not really explicable a human being feels divine presence then he can put it into words then he can describe it he can systematize it but the ultimate remains a mystery and is only either experienced or it is not experienced at all now when modern social science attempts to deal with human problems we fall into some very very peculiar pitfall for instance social science attempts to deal with cities and at first they come up with problems of urban renewal which everybody of course applauds and then it turns out that urban renewal does not really serve the interests of the minorities but does something quite different and is in the interests of completely different groups of people I remember the slogans in New Haven during urban renewal there and I'm sure that New Haven was not unique it, it certainly was even more so in other cities but urban renewal was said to be simply Negro removal precisely, precisely this was a way of getting rid of the minority because in the ghetto in the center of the town they were visible and therefore they bothered the conscience of at least some people take them out of the center of town build three more nations and everything is fine with society now mind you again I don't like to operate on the principle of conspiracy I'm not saying that those social scientists who advocated those programs that from the very start they had sinister motives they were going to go and do horrible things to people no they simply don't know themselves and as they propose a program and the program begins to operate all kinds of interests begin to operate and the program is either toned down changed, transformed, transmuted until its own author its own father will not recognize the ugly child that is finally that is finally produced I have a friend whom I will not identify and I will not identify the institution or organization for which he works because I'm sure that this is not a very popular organization these days but this friend of mine <coughs> a middle aged man and I think a wise one said to me once recently he said do you realize that the Vietnam War was the first war planned and conducted by social scientists and all of a sudden I got the point everything was calculated the right way experts were used the universities made their contribution the exact amount of force necessary to produce certain effects was calculated computers worked over time there were certain things that social scientists did not put into the mix into their formula not because they were obtuse but because they could not handle such problems 
For instance, the spirit of the other side. But what is spirit? How do you, which hole do you punch on which car? How do you quantify? What do you do with nebulous ideas like that? More, certain assumptions are made. For instance, the assumption is made, everybody is selfish. So, if you have your agents that can offer everybody certain things, these people will come over to our side. You go out, you begin driving everybody, everybody takes your money, but everybody does not come to your side. <laughs> How do you come to that? There was a conversation, there was a conversation, this was a long, long time ago, so this is not mixing in politics, this is a 19th century story, but an English diplomat and a Russian diplomat were talking about the Persians. And the English diplomat said, all the Persians can be bought. And the Russian diplomat said, yes, they all can be bought, but they don't stay bought. <laughs> now, this sort of thing, this sort of thing escapes the social scientists whose view of man is a rather flat, one-dimensional one. All right, if this view, if this view is not correct, if religion indeed can provide us with values, then where do we go? I try to indicate that in my opinion, the traditional religions do not provide us with value simply because it is impossible any longer to decide what values they represent. Committees don't seem to be any good for our purposes. So what, what are we to, ex to expect? Well, it's simple. A religion will either occur or it won't. It will not be invented, it will not be produced on demand. Now the Baha'is, come and present a really stupendous claim. They say that a religion has occurred in our own times. But in the 19th century, in Persia, there lived a man in whom time and eternity met again. His name was Baha'u'llah, and he brought certain teachings. Obviously, this would neither be the time nor the place to try to tell you everything about the history of the Baha'i faith or about its uh, ideals, principles, institutions. But let me simply indicate three conditions which are indispensable for the success of a religion that would have impact on the world today. These three conditions are principles organization and spirit. We are now in the midst of the, of the football season, so football metaphors become almost inevitable. <coughs> one, one seeks illustrations and uh, somehow visions of the great iron come to, to mind. But one could say that in a religion which is to be valid, the principles must be the rules or the theory of the game. The principles tell what is it that we are about, what is it that mankind is supposed to achieve. In other words, what constitutes social value, what constitutes individual value. Now, Baha'u'llah taught about unity as the greatest value for mankind today. In fact, he made certain radical statements about it, which sound very really peculiar, considering that he was a founder of religion. He said, for instance, that if religion is not the cause of unity, better not to have a religion. That is how much emphasis he wanted to place on the necessity of unity. Unity without any holes bar, a complete, a total unification of mankind. Now, mind you, this is not an attack on diversity. This is not to say that we are going to decide that, let us say, 20th century American lifestyle is it, and we are going not to permit the Dutch to be Dutch anymore, or whatever other people. This is not what is meant. And a 
social unity, a recognition of common humanity and participation in human society as equals by all the people of, of the world. Now such a unity, which theoretically is desirable, most people today actually, if you push them hard enough, will say, well, this is not a particularly novel attitude, it is quite obvious that the only way to establish peace is to create some kind of, of unity. Then the question arises, how come nobody is doing anything about it? How come ideas of unity, of world government for instance, without which we cannot assure peace, are not really popular? Again, 25, 26 years ago, right at the end of the Second World War, I almost said of the war, <laughs> people who were the liberals of that day, people who were left of center, people who were progressive, were joining the world federalist movement. Today, if there is a meeting of world federalists in Bhutan, chances are all the people of the meeting will be my age or old. What do they represent? They represent another failure of an idea. How come young people aren't there? <coughs> World terrorism served up as a political ideal is not exciting, not for long. Now what the Baha'i faith proposes is world federalism, which is made part of the spiritual guts of every human being, his religion. See, what the Baha'i faith does, it endows certain principles with which many, many people agree, endows them with a dynamic that comes from the power of religion itself. Now, so much for the, so much for the principle of, of unity. There are other principles which are actually ancillary to this. You cannot, you cannot teach people about the unity of, of nations, about the equality of races, about world government, without providing them with a modicum of education. So universal education is part of the Baha'i view of the, of the world. These are then just some of the principles scratching the surface. But, contrary, contrary to what people like to say these days, principles by themselves, goodwill by itself, really don't get us any place. Some people say, well, religion cannot be organized. Pray tell, you want religion to be disorganized? This is precisely what is the problem with the world today. Some people feel that we are being standard by bureaucracy. But you know why? Because we are disorganized. It is disorganization which breeds bureaucratic control. If we could get organized, we would have less bureaucracy. But how do you organize? Under what, under what form? Well, religions have never been very good at organizing. And again, we have neither time nor, nor is this the place to talk, for instance, about the organization of the early Christian church, which basically copied the institutional framework of the, of the Roman Empire. Never mind. The fact remains that if a number of ideals are presented to mankind, and mankind likes these ideals, the very next problem is who is going to control these ideals? Who is going to be in charge? How these ideals are going to be implemented? By whom? And it is, it is horrifying, it is tragic to see how many exciting and interesting ideals produced in the 19th and the 20th centuries, or even earlier, in the 18th, have perished precisely because they fell into the hands of, became the possession of, people who pretended to be the custodians of these ideals, but then perverted them and used them for other ends. The, the history of the last 200 years is strewn with bits and pieces, with ruins of these various movements. In fact, 
movements which began as humanitarian peace loving movements and ended in an unrelieved horror. So it is very important to see who is organizing, how, for what purpose, who controls them. Now here again, the Baha'i faith <coughs> is unique because the organizational principles of the Baha'i faith, the way in which the Baha'i community is run, the way it is organized, is not an afterthought, is not the product of people who got hold of the Baha'i principles and are now trying to get hold of them and run an organization that would carry them out. Rather, these principles have been proclaimed simultaneously by Baha'u'llah himself as he was establishing his religion. Therefore, the Baha'is have achieved something which is, which is most unusual. They have achieved organizational forms which themselves are religion. No clergy, no sacraments, complete and universal participation by the membership, and yet these principles are embedded in the faith itself. Now the last element that I mentioned, the element of spirit, is the most elusive and the most difficult to discuss. Principles can be written down on the, on the black one, two, three, four, five. Organization can be represented by, by charm. One can agree or disagree, one can argue about these things. How does one explain the spirit? I suppose the closest one could come would be by reciting poetry or, or playing music. The trouble with that, of course, is that neither in real good poetry nor in really fine music is the expression specific enough. So how does one convey the spirit? And this is where any kind of a presentation of a religion has to, has to break down by the, by the very nature of things. The only way that the spirit of a faith, of a religion, can be sensed is through the study of its history and through the study of its sacred writings. Now, Baha'i history is still young and short. The Baha'i faith originated in the middle of the 19th century. The founder, Baha'u'llah, died in 1892. Until recently, and, and still today, there are a few people left who remember meeting Baha'u'llah. This is how close we are to the, to the origins, to the beginnings of the, of the Baha'i faith. Yet, in that brief history, certain things have already happened. It has become possible in that brief span to create an international community in well over 300 countries, territories and dependencies throughout the world where people literally of every race, every ethnic background, every religious background have been welded by that undefinable spirit into a single recognizable community. More in the process of doing so, well over 20,000 people have been, have been killed. The Baha'i faith had very bloody origins. When it started it was met with opposition and with massacre. But the massacre is not over yet. Just a few weeks ago in Mindanao in the Philippines, three young university students, Baha'is from Persia, went out into some villages to talk to people about their faith. They were attacked, they were hacked to pieces, and their bodies buried in a shallow grave, just a few weeks ago. So the Baha'is are still paying with their lives for their faith. Now these are elements that go into the creation of a spirit of a religion. And it is the spirit which ultimately validates the principles and the institutions. When these three come together, 
you've got. There is a principle in the Baha'i Faith which perhaps I should have mentioned at the, at the outset. Philosophically speaking, it is, it is the first principle. But uh, perhaps in other ways it is not. And that is the principle of independent investigation. Traditionally it has been that we have received our religions from our parents. And mind you, there is nothing wrong with that as long as the religion remains vital and true. Some of you who know me could turn to me and say, well, who are you to talk? Your father is a Baha'i, isn't he? Indeed, I have accepted the religion of my father. But, I accepted it under certain special conditions where it was explained to me that ultimately I have to make a choice. My father and my mother in me gave me the Baha'i faith, explained it to me, acquainted me, me with it, but they did not isolate me from other influences. In fact, I went to school in Moscow and the highest grade I got on my graduation from a Soviet school was in, uh, in uh, Marxism, in Marxism class. Uh, I did much better in that than in math. I almost flunked geometry. And in this class, of course, we had to study, we had to study uh, atheism and pass exams in it and argue the point, argue against religion, and I'm still prepared to give anybody a good argument. <laughs> I haven't forgotten my, my upbringing. In other words, the opportunities were there for me to make up my own mind. But this independent, the principle of independent investigation, is extremely important to Baha'is because religion has to be revalidated by every human being on earth for himself at least once in a lifetime. Otherwise it becomes ballast. Otherwise it becomes something which is simply inherited. And as I said, maybe it's good, but maybe it isn't. And you will never know until you have invested it. But of course it also creates certain, certain barriers for a, for a Baha'i. Because a Baha'i who wants to tell other people about his faith, in fact, can only do one thing. He can invite investigation. Thank you.